original publishers like Skira, Alba Michelle, Thames and Hudson, and Artelife has brought out some notable publications. I would like to express my gratitude for the immense support of the editors during this long and rewarding journey of the book. It has been a pure labor of love and selfless uh, work by the eminent editors, contributors, our research team, design team, and coordination team at Artelife. We have to, uh, we thank everyone who believed in us and our vision and came forward to support this project. It's a very, very special moment as we gather here today for the launch of 20th Century Indian Art. We've been talking about this launch for over last three to four years. And finally, it's in here today. And I had uh, Kavita telling me it's the right moment. I think any time would have been the right moment. But we are very happy that we are doing it today. As, um, and we hope that this book will fill the lacuna that exists in the documentation of modern and contemporary Indian art. I would like to thank the fair director, Jaya Sokan, and the team at India Art Fair for hosting this event. I invite Premjish uh, on stage, who will be moderating the panel discussion for us today uh, after the launch. Uh, Premjish is a well-known curator, art critic, teaches at art history at Shivnado University. Premjish, please join me. Thank you, Selena. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Selena. But uh, I also want to thank you for your for tirelessly pursuing this vision, and that has led to this moment. So thank you for that. Uh, good morning and welcome everyone uh, to this panel discussion and book release. Uh, before we enter into the panel discussion, we have a short introductory video. And uh, before we watch that, I will introduce the panel today uh, very briefly. So first, uh, we have with us Partha Mitha, one of the editors. Uh, he's an honorary delet from Courtauld Institute London, Emeritus Professor, Art History, University of Sussex. His most well-known books include Much Malign Monsters, History of European Reactions to Indian Art uh, from 1977, Art and Nationalism in Colonial India, 1850 to 1922, uh, and The Triumph of Modernism, India's Artists and the Avant-Garde, 1922 to 1947, published in 2007. I welcome you to this panel discussion, Bhattata. Thank you for joining us. We have uh, editor Parul Dave Mukherjee, who is professor at the School of Arts and Aesthetics, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and holds a PhD from Oxford University. Her books include Arts and Aesthetics in a Globalizing World, 2014, uh, Ibrahim al Kazi, Directing Art, The Making of a Modern Indian Art World, 2016, and Rethinking Aesthetics in a Comparative Frame. I welcome you, Parul, ma'am, for this discussion. And then we have uh, the third editor who is not with us today, could not join us because of some administrative responsibilities and all. Uh, but I will introduce the third editor, who is Rakhi Balram, uh, who is also a professor of global art and history at University of uh, Albany, State University of New York, where she teaches modern and contemporary art. Uh, she has published widely on modern Indian art, and her most recent book is on counterpractice, Psychoanalysis, Politics, and the Art of French Feminism, published in 2022. And finally, we have Manuela Chioti, who is a professor of social and cultural anthropology of the Global South at the University of Vienna. Uh, she's the author of Retro Modern India, Forging the Low Caste Self, and Unsettling the Archetypes, Feminities and Masculinities, Indian Politics, published in 2017. Uh, sorry, not finally, we have Professor Naman Piahuja, who is a professor and dean of the School of Arts and Aesthetics at JNU. He's also general editor of Mark Publications. He has curated some of the most important exhibitions of Indian art in the past 10 years, including The Body in Indian Art and Thought, which was shown at the Palais de Beaux Art in Brussels, and the National Museum in Delhi in 2013, and India and the World, in which 120 objects from the British Museum were staged in strategic dialogue with Indian objects at the CSMVS Mumbai and the National Museum Delhi. Thank you for joining today, Manuela and Professor Ahuja. I welcome you to this panel discussion. 
I request all of you to come to stage and unveil the book. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, so we will play a short introduction video about the book that will give you about an idea about an overview about the content in the book. So uh, let's view, watch that. publication of 20th century Indian art is a unique event in the annals of modernism. It covers the long 20th century, witnessing travel and communication revolutions, political upheavals, world wars and genocides, and their impact on artists in the South Asian subcontinent. The volume answers those critics who complain rightly that there are no comprehensive histories of non-Western modernism to compare with the ones published in Europe and America. We, the editors, believe that this landmark volume will fill that lacuna with considerable success. like India, there cannot be a single story of modernism. So 20th century Indian art has emerged out of a long period of gestation. It started as a straightforward narrative, decade by decade, until we were struck by the glaring omissions of current historiography. Rather than building yet another master narrative that says it all, we have concentrated on events that we think are historically significant. So the idea was not simply to plug the gaps, but to rethink the logic of the narrative itself. So how does the regional make itself visible in art practice, especially in South India and the Northeast, the two regions which have remained outside the average? And here, the return to the figurative around 1970s Baroda emerges as a key post-colonial moment with wide ramifications for contemporary art. My section ends with a critical meditation on the national modern in the light of M.F. Hussain's departure from India, which takes us to the new India and its diverse practices. Part 
three of 20th century Indian art explores the impact of globalization from the early 1990s onwards. At this time, momentous economic, cultural, and political shifts were taking place in the country. Artists too felt the impact. While painting, sculpture, photography, and printmaking continued to evolve from the post-independence decades, the 1990s saw a greater intensification of installation, performance, and new media art. At the same time, a sensitivity to the rights of minorities was taking shape. Women artists, Dalit artists, and folk and tribal artists made their presence felt alongside a growing concern for the environment. Finally, we look at a proliferation of worldwide biennials and triennials and other exhibition venues that saw Indian artists and those from its diaspora find their place on a global stage. Walter Benjamin said, criticism is a matter of correct distancing. I'll keep a distance from all of you as a moderator. But before I begin, uh, I have a few things to say. Uh, very shortly about the book, it's like a declaration of sorts, a love letter of sorts. But uh, finally, the book is here. And the opening sentence of the book, 20th Century Indian Art, goes like this. It would be audacious, to say the least, to present 20th century Indian art as a coherent and self-contained subject." Unquote. I will not say audacious, but inventive and courageous to take up this task, and I congratulate the three editors, authors, and Art Alive for making this dream a reality. We can proudly say this is our book, an answer to the geopolitical bias of dominant centers of North American and Western European spheres of influence. A few days back, uh, Manuela had raised a very important question about the genre of this book. Yes, what is this book? Is it art history? Is it an encyclopedia? It is, a, is it a compendium? Is it a manifesto? I think it is all of it. And it will equip us to rewrite the dominant narratives, to present a new understanding of the actors, and to raise 
substantial questions about the trajectories and genealogies of art from the subcontinent. We have a book that is filled with immense possibilities. It is neither exclusivist in its vision and exclusionary in its framework. The maps are redrawn and open new avenues of research and exhibition making. The book presents a new optics of multiple voices, experiences, and expressions. It is a unique collaboration that addresses antagonisms that are methodological, historical, cultural, and political. The editors are also well aware of the tremendous weight of the canonical art history and how its institutionalization can overshadow any humble attempt to chart alternative paths. No, we do not have to abandon the canon, but we have to work with it and against it to acknowledge and identify the persistent blind spots of that history and the Eurocentric limits that it places on artistic activities outside Europe and North America, and most importantly, the exclusions created by our own art history. So I congratulate all of you for this inspiring, commendable, and empowering book, a manifesto for the people of the darker nations to decolonizing. So I begin this discussion by asking the first question to Parthada. So we will try to keep some time, at least 10, 15 minutes for discussion too. So I will also request all of you to be brief, uh, not very brief, but be brief. And that gives you enough time to sharpen your names, uh, names at the end and like raise some critical questions so you also be prepared. So uh, Parthada, uh, please help us understand the origins of the book and what was its necessity, the context of the origin of the book and what, was, what is its scope in the global art history? Also to be precise, when did the three of you decide to ruin the next 14 years of your lives? Hello, all right. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, lots of questions which are very important. Uh, let me try and answer one by one. Okay, the lacuna. The need. Why? Um, let me go back a little bit, it's slightly autobiographical. Um, when I started my research, one of the things I was very aware of that um, we had been decolonized in 1947, but I still felt that our minds, but also more importantly, I would say, the minds of the colonizers hadn't been decolonized, very important. Uh, and art history was certainly subject to this. Um, so, um, the problem was that art history has had its own rules its assumptions, which was a, a canons, of course, which were always seen, uh, the West was seen as the dominant force and the rest of the world followed the West. So my work began with decolonizing our, my, everyone's mind globally, but also in my first book, it. Um, uh, Premish uh, very kindly mentioned, uh, Much and Monsters, decolonizing art history. But then, gradually other things began to happen. Uh, about uh, uh, this millennium, one of the questions that came to the fore, uh, global art, globalization, what does it mean? You know, I, I, don't, I'm, uh, I, I think globalization is not all bad. It's good and bad. Uh, but what is the problem? And I have been arguing from 2008 to today, and actually all over the world, that um, we need to decolonize modernism. Because modernism assumes that Europe was the sole kind of creator and had the full copyright. So others had to actually accept it. Uh, I have, uh, I don't know how much I've succeeded, but uh, art historians from 
East Europe to Brazil and other places have been very responsive. But having said all this, let me be brief. I'm, I'm, now, I'm taking a bit of time. I always had this question from European art historians. I know them, many of them well. Yes, yes, Arthur, of course. We want to know about Indian art, but there's no book. What is modernism? Is it just part of European modernism, just a kind of slightly derivative, suffering from time lag? So I said, that is what we need, a history, a narrative of um, uh, modern, uh, I call it modern Indian art, in and out throughout the 20th century, a very important period. Now, at this uh, point, I hadn't uh, thought, you know, absolutely precisely when there were, I would say, <laughs> there was kind of conjunction of favorable planets. It's the, it must have been <laughs> the <laughs> Panjika <laughs> predicted. I met, uh, you know, very, very uh, enabling and also very energetic and quite strong uh, woman. Can I say that? A friend, uh, Sunana Anand. Sunana came to see me and uh, she said, Path, the, I would like you to buy, uh, re write a book on Indian art. I said, oh gosh, it would take a lot of doing. I'm not sure, I was hesitant. But she persisted and she's, she won over. So I said, yes, I will do that. But I need a very you know, important, uh, let's say, collaborator as the past part of the team, or part of the whole thing. And, um, so I said, Parul would be the best person. I knew Parul well for many years. So I said, yes, Parul and I can begin to plan this. And then finally, I suppose Parul and I together uh, decided that Raki Balaram was a very fine art historian to join our team. You would see in the book, it's divided into various parts. I decided to only concentrate on my part and let Paul look at the, you know, be responsible for the second part and finally Rocky, uh, sort of uh, recent global postmodern art. So that was important, autonomy. But then you could say, oh, it's a, it's a compendium. It's a, uh, you know, a series of S's, no uh, organic unity. And that is totally wrong what we did right through. And with actually discussion with Sunana and also if I may uh, mention Vimal, began to shape the book that we looked carefully at the organic element, how the whole thing hangs together. And that's the important thing. There have been some, you know, really uh, collection races, et cetera, but that's not the point. What is the history and uh, what is the actual narrative and narratives? Because India is a multicultural, multilingual, multi-religious uh, country, a, a subcontinent. Therefore, we want it to be inclusive. Also, we felt that there were lacuna like South India, various other parts, you know, and also I felt, um, I may say so, women, LGBT groups, and other so-called minorities had to have a powerful voice. And there were lots of wonderful artists in these communities and often neglected. So that, that's how the whole thing started. It was a very painful process, 14 years of hell. Okay, I, have I more or less answered all your questions? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> marginalization, the exclusion, uh, Eurocentrism, and all that, but what about the internal marginalization? Uh, because you also start your introduction uh, by speaking about the rise or the emergence of the citizen artists mm -hmm. after independence, who assumed that we could rise above caste, gender, all these identities. But we have to understand how these categories also fracture us 
And for a long time, art history has also been silent about these mm -hmm. categories and the marginalization. So how has the book addressed this issue? Yeah, so I have uh, been attentive to my own location. I think what Parthoda does is he looks at uh, you know, the larger landscape of what India looks, looks like from his perspective, which is a perspective which is not available to me because I am more closely interested in looking at the internal process of marginalization, the internal othering. And um, in fact, yesterday I had attended a very interesting panel uh, which celebrated 25 years of Art India. And uh, there was a very interesting question which came up, you know, raised by one of the um, members of the audience. And it was, uh, does the magazine or journal uh, reflect the creativity of 1.3 billion Indians? And I thought that was a very important question. And that question actually helps me to uh, foreground the issues that I have dealt with. Exactly, what are the internal politics of marginalization? And that's what I really attend to. Um, I also look at, uh, you know, the whole idea of the regional modern. Uh, and the more you look at the regional modern, you realize that there are regions which are outside the metropolitan centers. For example, the Northeast, which have never been part of the, you know, official historiography of Indian art. So that was one of our efforts. And uh, I, in the process, I realized that as art historian, one is operating between the two axes. Of course, one is out of time. Uh, it is true that which, I mean, one really looks at the historical. But at the same time, it's very important to bring in space because that gives you the vector to deflect attention from this linear narrative, which we really wanted to avoid. So once you halt in your teleological narrative and you look around, you begin to notice things which were not you know, really talked about. And that's when we looked at these internal you know, others, so to speak. So apart from, yes, the Northeast, which, is, which really features prominently, and it's been written by one of the young uh, you know, uh, critical researcher, we also look at double marginalization. That is what happens if you're looking at women artists who are also operating from a regional center, which is which is away from the metropolitan cities. And that really takes you into the whole dizzying world of you know, uh, the ca counter canon and how to retrieve that and place it within the mainstream of Indian historiography. So that was one of the central aims of the book. Thank you, thank you. I'll again extend this discussion and I'll ask uh, Professor Ahuja and no one-liners are accepted. I have to give <laughs> a detailed answer to this, which is also kind of taking from your own chapter in the book uh, about the problem of the art craft binary and also the, or, or the marginalization of craft in the Indian art history. And central to this problem is the colonial elevation of fine arts as high art and also kind of uh, the inferior stature of craft as something ornamental or inferior or whatever. And that is also still continuing at the policy level, even after independence, uh, also in the art practice and also in pedagogy. And your chapter examines this problem in a renewed light. And you propose that we need a two-way process to understand the position of craft in Indian art history. One is that we have to examine the attempts of modern Indian urban studio artists to negotiate a chrome on ground with tradition and artisanship. The second is the study of how traditional artists and craftspeople have interfaced with the circuits of modern and contemporary art. So what, is, what do you think? How do we tackle this problem, this binary? Um, in the quest for looking for an Indian expression for modern art, a number of artists in the 20th century went on a quest for locating their roots in craftsmanship and in traditional Indian methods of making and leading to collaborations with um, But uh, there's a truck because we don't know what quite to do with it, how to represent it. We don't have an apparatus in the museum or in the gallery to be able to deal with it. Without dealing with it, we can't come up with a history of Indian modernism 
because Indian modernism needs to be able to look at its own past. And I kept thinking, is the problem coming out of a definition of modernism that we are following? And do we need to have a more capacious, a wider definition of modernism? And several colleagues have been writing and talking about that. But one of the great systems of thought, which was at the foundations of, the modern, of modernism, was the arts and crafts movement. And I became curious to explore what is the historiography of the arts and crafts movement, and why was it so problematic, and why can we not accept it and critique it, just as we critique and accept the definition, defining principles of modernism. And there I found a very valuable means to be able to intervene, because I think the arts and crafts movement provides us with an exciting historiography where they never ran away from issues such as religion. They didn't shy away from dealing with, uh, uh, dealing with communitarian ownership, uh, guild-based production. Um, it was always chastised for having been too medievalist as if it was trying to get a throwback to some past. But I don't think it's only there to go so to some medieval hallowed past but it was actually trying to find a means to be able to get into a real future, one that was more inclusive, of the very communities that we find difficult to represent in our galleries and museums. So maybe rather than working through the signature-based domain of modern art and modernism, if we try to accept the more communitarian basis of working that the arts and crafts movement allowed, our institutions might be able to do better in, be more in, in being able to represent them better. And there I found the work of, I took the case studies of four or five artists who have tried to bridge that divide. So I work, looked at Jamini Roy, and then Devi Prasad, and then Dashrat Patel, and tried to look at how design and tradition has been a kind of way of thinking for all of them, and how they've worked with ateliers or with guilds to be able to come up with this. So it's, that's the two-way process that was manifest in their work. That's, that's I think, the, of what I tried to do. Sorry. <laughs> I hope it's Thank not you. a sh quick one-liner. Not, not, one <laughs> okay. not a one-liner. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, so for the last few days, uh, Manuela and I were also discussing about, and this is also coming from Manuela, the before and after event of the book and what kind of takeaways uh, can come from this book. And uh, so this is a speculative turn, like a speculative question we are uh, kind of, I'm asking Manuela here. And there are various takeaways, there are multiple pathways that can be charted from this book. Uh, one of the important areas of concern for me is how the book will influence the way we look at exhibition histories and also what kind of future exhibitions may come out of this book. So, would you like to comment on that? Sorry, thanks. Uh, thanks, Premjish, for this question. Um, well, my eminent colleagues here have actually illustrated the kind of knowledge project that this book represents, and they place an enormous burden, I think, Oh, okay, and, and um, so my colleagues have illustrated the um, um, enormous kind of knowledge project that this book represents, and they place an enormous burden also on art history as a knowledge form. And I'm actually an anthropologist, so I'm an anthropologist among uh, uh, art historians. So this comes from uh, my comments, you know, come from this standpoint. And I really, I'm really interested in, you know, I'm, I'd, I'd really like to think of a before and an after. And so what this book, will be able to actually um, do, you know, to the ways in which exhibitions are organized, not only in India, but also, you know, outside. And what, um, what will be the place of these micro-histories? And uh, I love uh, the, the art history of elsewhere that, the, you know, they, the, the editors beautifully, uh, you know, describe, you know, the, I think they would be, this would be like a title, a subtitle of this book. Um, so what is going to happen with this book? And so I'm really interested in the social lives of this book, the future social lives of this book, because um, it's great to have this knowledge project all in one big tome, but it's also 
um, I think, crucial to understand, you know, what this book can actually do um, to future projects. And I come to this question as, uh, as someone who's been interested in the global circulation, actually, of art um, uh, you know, out of India. My uh, small contribution to this book is, is a text box box on the first national participation of India at the Venice Biennale in 1954. I have tons of material. This is going to be a book-length publication. Um, and, uh, and, I really, um, and I really think that, as John Clark actually has argued in one of the essays here, that the international and the transnational categories, categories should, should be used much more to approach art history. It's really making this point. So I'm really coming from that side, in a way. And, uh, and I think the circulation is essential, because we know symbolic and financial value is actually uh, uh, produced by a circulation, and, um, and not just within India, but also out of India. The two trends, actually, you know, they co-constitute themselves. And so it's very important for these, um, you know, micro-histories, the, the artists that, you know, uh, I was browsing the book, and a lot of people I've really never heard of before, and, uh, you know, I felt totally ignorant, and I said, thank God, you know, we have uh, a place where, uh, you know, um, finally, um, people have a presence, you know, they're not invisible anymore. And I think this is also a big project of making the invisible visible, which I think is it's absolutely great. And so, um, yes, so my, uh, my hope is that the, the, you know, the knowledge project that is contained in this really heavy book can actually widely circulate and can be appropriated, you know, um, all over. And can it also, this also can become a template for writing histories, art histories of the Global South, from the Global South, but also in the Global North. Why not, right? <laughs> so that's, um, that Thanks, would be my Manuela. answer. Thanks, Manuela. If, if we get time, uh, we will extend this discussion too. But there's a sub-question to you, and um, I'll, I'll come back to you. But I will uh, go to the editors now, both of you. It's a common question, and I think you can answer uh, one by one. It's about the three important sections of the book and the logic of the periodization. What kind of periodization and what is the rationale of that particular periodization which you have selected? If you could talk about that. So, uh, you know, when we started working on it, um, as Parthuda mentioned, it was quite a modest project. It was just both of us. Uh, and at that time, we were really thinking of uh, something which is possible in two years. So we thought, why not a decade by decade progression of art history? And then, um, we realized that we are falling into the trap of linear narrative, mm. and we have to really break out of it. And fortunately, we had the third editor joining us, Raki Balram, who brought her fresh insights and energy. And then um, we also decided to um, address this big question which came up at that time is, so we are three editors, and we have three different styles of thinking, writing, responding to the questions of the modern and the contemporary. So in fact, it was part of that suggestion that why not have three distinct sections? So from 1900 to 1947, which is really part of part of that's, you know, yeah. era of specialization. So he concentrates on that. And then I take up from post-independence uh, period, 47 to 1990s, uh, and with the so-called post-colonial period. And then Draki steps in from 1990s to almost the contemporary. So this allowed us to uh, retain our voices rather than, you know, you know, kind of diluting our own positions and trying to speak in one voice, which would go against the very ethos of what we are trying to achieve, to keep plurality of voices and different ways of looking at time, space, identities. Yeah. Um, absolutely. It's on, it's on. Is it working? It's on. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, uh, uh, you're absolutely right, uh, Parul. Um, one of the interesting problems with any uh, history of art is the structure of narrative. And um, actually, now it is rightly a very linear, simple narrative is now under question. And that, I think that's quite correct. But the problem is no art history is perfect. And um, we have to all of us had to think how to make the whole story meaningful as well. And um, so we, of course, had our own areas. And the convenience of this is that 
at least we can then work on our own specialization. But then I believe there's also linked from one to the next. I also believe that India, uh, I mean, can't be denied that westernization had a powerful impact. Um, it, it was a catalyst, but what India produced was much more its own. It's the context. Uh, the Indian voice that was important. So starting with that, how our art was transformed from traditional, um, you know, more or less, um, I mean, non-artists, artisan-based, and much more tied to courtly art, to a kind of uh, new independent artist. And the whole of this period of our struggle for independence, I take the period in my own work, 1850s to 1947, uh, the, these tensions between westernization and constantly assertions of uh, our identity. Uh, but then that's the period. Then, of course, next barrels was simply when we attain independence, what happens? And that was, a, in some ways, very complicated story. When you are fighting for independence, there's a certain unity. People more or less believe, you know, accept same rules, but then becomes more diffuse and diverse. And that's your sort of period is very complex. And finally, with Rocky, with globalization, it was really amazing. So diaspora, you know, all kinds of different things coming up. Particularly, art galleries, art auctions. These were very important you know, forces that shaped and transformed art. So these are the different aspects, but they're ultimately uh, subject to unity. And uh, also the boxes are very important as information. If you get lost, have a look at the box. <laughs> and uh, uh, then of course time frame. And I also feel that interviews were very important. They were very interesting and they also are illuminating. Yep, yep, I just want to respond to the comment you made in passing, that phrase that you've, you've used tongue-in-cheek, um, you know, um, art from elsewhere, art history from elsewhere. You, you refer to it. And this was really um, a, our own uh, kind of, a, you know, uh, sarcastic <laughs> response to art since 1900, which has really become a canonical book. And uh, the very fact that uh, Global South is barely registered. So this was... This can be seen as a response to that huge lacuna and absence. But having said that, I must also clarify my stance because I have been, like Partha, I have been interested in you know, the post-colonial discourse and decolonization of art history and so on. But I also realize that there are dangers of uh, beating the drum of ethnocentrism. You know? How long can you go on critiquing Eurocentrism? What is more important and responsible is the actual hard work of writing your history doing archival work, and I must also add that, yes, we three are the editors, but this book ultimately has to be seen as a collaborative work, yeah. because very important collaboration has been made by the contributors. There are 46 chapters. Uh, some of the seminal art historians, critics from all over the world have responded to and have uh, contributed to this volume, and some of them are sitting right here. I'm very happy to see our contributors. Um, and so I think um, one of the uh, textbook writers, a young art historian, Srajana Kaikini, in her Facebook post, she wrote something very nice. She said, it's a, uh, it's a um, collective, it's a collective endeavor. Yes, and that's precisely the spirit that we also want to celebrate. Yes. That it, this would not have been possible if three of us had taken the initiative writing the histories. So we, what we did, we, realized or we tried to figure out who are the specialists in the particular domain and we identified them, we invited them to write on topics we, we thought are very important to the larger history. Uh, I think yeah. Sorry, just to add to uh, Parul's thing, it's ultimately a teamwork and that's very important and success and failure would depend on how successful we were in forming the team and you know, working together. And I hope it has been successful. So, 
It's a massive team. It's more than Avengers Assemble. It's like 40 writers plus 40 what box contributions. So it's quite huge. That's so what happens as a result is that the book comes across with <clears throat> such a plurality of voices and positions. And that's quite refreshing because it makes you, um, you don't approach it like the way you would normally approach a, a book on a subject which has uh, authorial command and it's all written in neatly in past tense and thus history is presented, you know? And it's not like that. This is, this is 40 different voices often taking uh, a slightly different stance and a slightly different position, a different um, approach to the way they think history needs to be told or written. And, and that, I think, is the strength of the book because you don't settle into a groove as a reader uh, of being instructed in the knowledge by one you know, uh, master voice. And, and that's very refreshing. Thanks. Uh, I, and, and I think that, I mean, as I read it as an open-ended book, like because you, in the, uh, you editors say, well, you know, all of these will be enriched, maybe changed, modified, transformed by archival research. The, you know, the thing that Parul, the activity, you know, <laughs> that Parul uh, was, uh, I just mentioned. And so this is monumental. This is, uh, you know, will break a lot of canons, internal, external, etc. But it's also open-ended. It's like an, I would say even in progress, right? Everything is in the making anyway. Under construction. Under construction, you know? <laughs> After 14 years, under construction. But that's, what, that's the impression that I got, you know, when you say, well, you know, these things will change, will be enriched, will be, yeah, um, by future research. And so let's do that <laughs> more, even more. Thank you. Thank you, thank you.